Yeah. Well, thank you for the very glowing introduction. Um, I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> as you can see, uh, the title of my talk is, I'm going to talk about interoperability, and in particular for biomedical texts. And I'm going to look at what exactly interoperability is and what it involves in a detailed way. I'm going to show you what uh, a current, what I consider to be a current state-of-the-art approach to it in the field of computational linguistics that I've been involved in. And then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to actually show you an attempt to make our stuff and pub annotation interoperable. Um, so I do want to uh, make a disclaimer. I'm a computer scientist, I'm a computational linguist, and I'm pretty much new to the field of biomedical uh, biomedicine. And so I, I understand about a third of what I hear. And I just want to uh, apologize if I, in advance, if I make any misstatements or inaccuracies or mischaracterize things. I've already heard a couple things this morning that suggest to me that I'm not, <laughs> I could use a little more familiarity. So anyway, um, the overview of what I want to talk about is um, there's been, from my point of view, coming into this, there are, you come in and all of a sudden there is this plethora of biomedical terminologies and ontologies, and they seem to be pretty much independent. And some have overlapping content, some have conflicting content, and when you look at them, they seem to have all their own representation schemas, their own semantic tags, term element relationships. It all seems to be kind of a tower of Babel. And as a result, not surprisingly in the field, you seem to hear a lot about the need for interoperability. So if you look at the definitions of some common things that I found, uh, UMLS, and it says it wants to have interoperable biomedical and information systems. National Library of Medicine uh, is doing development in order to facilitate the exchange of clinical data. Again, you must be interoperable to do the change, exchange. And this AMA and the International Health Terminology Standards Development Organization uh, also talk about interoperability of health information and analytics. So it's, it's a word that appears everywhere. Um, what I can, from what I can tell, in general, when people talk about interoperability in the field of biomedicine or the biomedical field, it's is really a quest for common vocabularies and terminology and ontologies. Um, so again, if you look at those same definitions, uh, integrates and distributes key terminology, classification, NLM talks about clinically specific vocabularies, and a, this AMA, IHT, SDO, International System of Coding and Medical Terminology. So that seems what it is, what it's focused on. <clears throat> so what I want to do is step back and, and look at what is interoperability. Um, if you look in the definition uh, in a dictionary, you might get something like the ability of a system, like a computer system or software, to exchange and make use of information. Um, or a couple more precise things from Wikipedia. It's the characteristic of a product or system whose interfaces are completely understood whatever that means, to work with other products or systems in the present or the future in, in either implementation or access without any restrictions. It's a little high level. Um, Biomedical Informatics, a book that is I have a, in a reference list at the end of this talk, the seamless exchange of information and consistent language and meaning. So this is the kind of thing. Now for humans, uh, there's actually a, a definition of interoperability, um, but it's really about communication. So the act of conveying intended meanings from one entity or group through the use of mutually understood signs and semiotic rules. And of course, going back to the linguist Grice, he says, all communication is the search for speaker intended meaning. 
So interoperability is that the hearer un understands exactly what was intended by the speaker, which I think most of you will realize doesn't always happen. So we have interoperability problems too. So more precisely for computers, data is in a format that's immediately readable and processable by a given piece of software, or the output of one soft piece of software can be read into and operated upon by another piece of software. And so what does that mean? Processable or operated on in any way that I can take it in and do something, anything with it? Or is it more precisely that it's processable or operated upon in a manner consistent with whatever the creator intended? So, so we have levels of this. So um, in fact, you, we can understand this better in terms of two general levels of interoperability. There's syntactic interoperability, which uh, has to do mainly with data formats, also with communication protocols and so on. I'm going to speak less about that, but um, that at the syntactic level is how we have interoperability. And then there is also semantic interoperability, and this is where I think biomedical field has focused on common terminology and so on and so forth, where the content is unambiguously defined and what is sent as what is the same as what is understood. Um, <coughs> syntactic interoperability um, involves systems involved. They can, they can process the exchange information, read it in, but there's no guarantee that the, that the interpretation is the same. So for example, if you had data in XML, and if you've got a piece of software that can recognize XML, that's great. It can read it. So you might have doc, you know, and with a PCAG, call me, name, Ishmael, and so on. That's great. And the software will read it in and say, hey, I've got brackets. I know what those are. But it has no idea what name is. And in terms of how a computer operates, what that means is that it doesn't know anything specific about the way the person who stuck that in there intended it to be processed, as opposed to, say, P or doc. Okay, so that syntactic interoperability, you can read it, but you might not know what to do with it. Semantic interoperability, of course, is um, intended to overcome these, that particular kind of thing. So it can not only read it, but it can interpret it and process it and operate it on it, a la the definition I just gave, meaningfully and accurately and as intended in order to produce useful results. And we talk about common information exchange reference models that usually are enabled. So our same uh, example here with this, in this case, the software that's interpreting it, it not only can read the XML at the syntactic level, but it knows that name, it needs to do something, and it's programmed to do something specific with that, that the person who put the tag in there to begin with intended uh, to be the meaning of it. Now, syntactic interoperability includes uh, communication protocols like SOAP and RESTful web services and so on. And it also includes metadata specifications. I'm going to talk about those a little bit later and right now focus on physical formats, a la IE things like the, the brackets for XML and so on. So um, there are actually two uh, sort of aspects of this. And so the previous talk was uh, fantastic. It, I don't have to even say anything about the different physical formats like PDF, which there, right there is a problem. And then we have things that we've um, just discussed in my examples where you have different representations for identifying parts of the data, like XML, maybe JSON or brackets, or there's an IOB format that some of you might be familiar with. I'll have an example of in a minute. 
Um, and again, the previous talk, I don't have to even say, getting PDF documents into text is not easy and it's not always 100% reliable and a lot of work goes into it. Um, and the way that people deal, let's say, with, with the second kind, which is a format issue, um, that is usually to do conversion. So you convert from one format into another. So here's an IOB format. Uh, you may be familiar with it because some of the bio NLP data is in this format. Um, you can't, you, it's not always easy because the IOB format just has the words in there. And suppose you want to put it in uh, another representation which uses standoff annotation. It doesn't have the word in there, but it gives you the location in the text. Well, it makes it very, it's not a trivial thing to, to do that kind of a thing. And you might even lose some information. Uh, people tend to start writing converters all over the place. And you often actually need some significant computational expertise to actually write the converge. And just to give you an example, uh, here are pieces of the bio NLP data. And just to show you that people do in fact use very different physical formats. You can see that there are one up there that has kind of some XML, but not really. And then it has some other things with underscores and vertical bars, and, and this one is XML, but its own XML. The names are its own names and don't necessarily correspond to anything else. Here's an, uh, one that uses standoff, uh, locating some named entities in, in the text. And here's one of the, the IOB um, things. So, if you were working on all of that data in the bio NLP, all of that, you, you're going to have to deal with the fact that you've got four different formats. So the current situation, I'm going to be extremely optimistic and say that there is some convergence on JSON as a common syntax. It, it's around. It's, it, we use it, and Pub Annotation uses it. Bio NLP 2016 also used it, but that's kind of because Pub Annotation used it. Um, but it is an, uh, a nice format. And, you know, it is, first of all, it's a semantic web thing. It's just another serialization of RDF for the most part, uh, especially JSON LD, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, JSON is a good, uh, good um, format because it, it's based on an underlying data model that's very common, uh, RDF OWL, for example. It's, it's graph-based. A lot of other things are graph-based. And it uses standoff annotations. So you aren't going and sticking stuff into the text. And in fact, instead, your annotations are associated with it, which is really nice, because then you can have multiple annotations of the same kind pointing to it. They can overlap. They can do whatever you want to do. Um, and these are practices that have been, uh, at least within the field of computational linguistics, really um, come to be accepted as the way to do annotation. Semantic interoperability, I will say, I have no answers for you, but it's a very big problem. These are the kinds of things that you have. The easy one is uh, conflicting terminology. You have the same concept. You have lots of different names. So this is a sort of silly example, but somebody might have RDFS common, and another thing might have note, and another thing might have description. Same name, same concept, different name. Um, in the UMLS Metathesaurus, it has contains, which is a component of, but in the semantic network, and the same bunch of people here, uh, is that's the uh, definition of ingredient of. So same name, same concept, different name. Um, oh, and computers have to be specially configured <laughs> to recognize these as the same. This is word sense disambiguation, right? Um, another problem is conflicting terminology. We have the same concept. Wait, where am I? Conflicting terminology. 
same concept. Oh, even though these, <laughs> sorry, I was trying to figure out. So what's the solution in the field of biomedicine? There is lots of terminology mapping, as far as I can see. Uh, UMLS seems to try to map vocabularies. Uh, Semantic Health Net I found. Um, I found an article on this health language blog about these mapping. Um, and it works as long as the concepts are exactly the same, but there's not, that's not always true. Uh, for example, RDFS common is more general than the note for, from SCA, so, and there are lots of many to one and one to many, and even overlapping and not quite one to one relations. Uh, so that isn't always trivial, but works. Uh, some a lot of the time, and especially in biomedicine, frankly, you're very lucky compared to natural language processing where we're dealing with really messy things like English, you know, where, where concepts are way less likely to be uh, equal than they are in biomedicine. Um, another problem which is that we observe is a different concept but the same name, and this is homonymy. Um, so we have APC, which can be argama, argon plasma coagulation or activated protein C. Cold can be, this one I can understand, even I, can be a common cold, cold temperature, or chronic obstructive lung disease. Uh, so, you know, if you've got COLD, um, and it turns out in ULMLS, there are about 50,000 terms which are associated with more than one concept. Another th problem is a related concept, the same name, um, and this is kind of what we call polysemy or complementary ambiguity, where it's basically the same basic meaning, but it diverges off. And in um, uh, human language, a good example might be paper, where you have a newspaper and then you also have a paper that someone writes. Etymologically, they come from the same thing, but they've, they've been distinguished uh, over time with, so that in different contexts, they mean slightly different things. And there are a couple examples that I could find uh, from the biomedical field. Uh, the enzyme, I won't even, you can read that, <laughs> okay? Um, and yeah, it's sort of interesting. So this is really, again, another problem of getting the correct meaning. And then the other problem, which I think gets less attention, is conflicting semantic structures. You have a terminology, you have an ontology in particular, you can get really different structures. What's an object? What's a property in linked data uh, world? Uh, there are organizational paradigms, your models, granularity. Everything is, is, uh, can be very different. And people just can be extremely uh, idiosyncratic in the way they do this. Now, if, if many of you are from the linked data community, I assume that you're well aware of how you can have two vastly different representations for the same thing in RDF. Um, something can be an object, something can be a property. I mean, in, in computational linguistics, we have a thing like is a noun, is it an object that's a part of speech, or is part of speech an object, or is it a property, or it's a, there's a lot of things uh, like that. So here's an example, um, not so much the top, but you might have the site in, in RDF, you might have the citation for a definition embedded in XML fragments in a resource, or a secondary data property, or uh, and, uh, many other kinds of things. Uh, those of you who are familiar with UEMA will know this phenomenon of different structural pro uh, configurations, the UEMA type system. And this is a very common thing also in my field of computational linguistics. Everybody is their own for uh, linguistic concepts that we tend to think everybody agrees on, but they're very, you can do very different things. And then there is a problem of information mismatch. Information required for one format might be missing in another. And I think that one of the uh, obvious 
places where this comes up is you have a lot of biological terminologies that were developed before the semantic web, and now people are trying putting them in LDL, and there's no formal, they, they really don't lend themselves to a formal logic-based representation, and you sort of have to re-engineer and interpret the information. So, for example, if you had bacteria cause infection, there are several different ways that can be interpreted, and you have to kind of guess what was meant there. So, for solutions, at least within the semantic web community, I see that people are trying to converge on uh, standard sets of tags or properties, but they're still across all sorts of different specifications, and a lot of the tags have identical or overlapping semantics. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that syntactic interoperability, I think it's coming along in terms of physical format and communication protocols. People are starting to converge at least on using things that have a common underlying data model, which enables easy mapping and conversion. Metadata, we still have some uh, way to go there. But semantic interoperability is still a huge problem. And there's no really clear and obvious solution in sight. So what I'm going to do now is um, try to show you what I've been working on for, in the recent past and has, has now brought me into the bio NLP world um, in a big way, where we consider that we have at least a state-of-the-art solution to interoperability, even though we know it isn't the be-all, end-all solution. And this comes out of work uh, over the past two or three decades, and I've been intimately involved in a lot of this work, where people have been um, addressing the interoperability problem for linguistic data and the annotations. It's just exactly the same as, as you have in the bio-NLP field, it's the same kinds of things. Um, one big group that w worked on this was the International Standards Organization, ISO, TC37, SC4, <laughs> data language data management something anyway. We had a linguistic annotation framework, and I was one of the people who helped devise that. And so drawing on all that experience, a lot of projects, and it's not just ours, but several in Europe and so on, have attempted to achieve interoperability um, for NLP tools. And my project is called the LAPS Grid, the Language Applications Grid. And it was funded by a program called Interop within um, the U.S. National Science Foundation. It's a collaboration of four institutions, Vassar, Brandeis University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Carnegie Mellon University. And I will mention, since I heard some mention of IBM Watson and so on, that the guy who was at Carnegie Mellon was one of the Watson developers. And we've actually incorporated some of the stuff from there into the lab script. And the goal of it is to provide some infrastructure so that you can retrieve text collections from providers and repositories, devise pipelines or workflows, whatever you call them, of interoperable web services that automatically annotate data and provide evaluation metrics and saving st storing and sharing pipelines uh, so that you can use, other, you and other people can use them. Um, so, you know, the overall thing is we want to give access to a bunch of NLP tools from several sources that are interoperable. We want to have people can create a custom application that can be a black box that other people can use. And this we got directly out of the Watson development, um, open advancement framework, uh, which was used in the development of Watson for evalu evaluation of components and applications. Um, licensing issues, of course, come into the play, but I won't talk about that. And we also want to pursue a creation of a really a global network of grids and frameworks. 
And just real quickly, I don't want to go over this. That's our configuration, but I do want to notice that, uh, to point out that we have been working with and have achieved interoperability with the Kyoto Language Grid and their affiliate affiliates, and with two um, systems within the Claren. For those of you from Europe, might be familiar with that framework. Um, one in Prague and one in Tübingen, and we've had funding for both of those things. And this one's done, and, and the Claren one we're almost finished. So, so we're feeling, you know, a little bit of <laughs> proof of concept here. Uh, we use as a front end another thing that might be familiar to you, which is Galaxy which was originally developed for genomics researchers, and it's a workflow engine um, that is designed to enable you to, to uh, create pipelines of, of tools that can perform certain um, analyses of data. And of course, originally their whole thing was genomics data, um, it's accessible. You don't have to be a programmer. It does a lot of capturing of information so you can reproduce and replicate somebody's experiment and results, which is becoming an increasingly important thing these days. And it's transparent. So we use the Galaxy framework as kind of a front end to combine our services and, you know, instead of of components to deal with genomics data, we have text processing pipelines um, that can do. So here's what it looks like, and this is the Galaxy front end. If you've ever used Galaxy, it looks just like this, except that now it says the language applications grid. Um, over down on the side is very badly organized, and we are in the process of <laughs> redoing that list of things that you can see that we have. Um, we actually have some bio-NLP data, we, and then um, <laughs> other things that are in there. We have, then you can see things like the tokenizers, the sentence splitters, the taggers. We have a whole bunch of all these tools from different sources, parsers, chunkers, co-reference, all of these things, and there are multiple tools from different places. And over here, this would be a a uh, uh, pipeline that somebody constructed. Uh, the nice thing about Labs Galaxy is you can use it in a number of ways. You can have, you can just go to http galaxylabsgrid.org right this very minute and you can use it. Uh, you can create your own local instance and we have an NLP flavor within Galaxy. Uh, they have flavors. You can create a Docker image so it's self-contained. We had to give, for example, a tutorial at the Na National Security Agency in the United States, and it had to be self-contained because it couldn't communicate with anything outside. Um, and it's also good you know, for a lot of clinical data and so on where you have privacy constraints. And you can create a Galaxy instance in the cloud and I will be working on one of those, the most recent one, it's our development, which is on the NSF Jetstream cloud, uh, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. And interoperability, so um, actually the Galaxy tools are not, the, the tools for genomics analysis that they have are not interoperable. They have tons of format converters. If you click on that, which I can't, this is a picture, but if you go to Galaxy, you can uh, see that they, they have converters from pairwise for all different kinds of, of things. Uh, but ours are interoperable. And let me just show you how that works. So for example, you can have a uh, bring in a, 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 a text, in this case it's from the manually annotated subcorpus, which is why it says that, can tokenize it with gate, and then you can do the sentence splitter. Uh, then you can feed that into a part of speech tagger from Stanford. And then you can feed that into an open NLP named entity recognizer. These are from all different places. And the conversion is done automatically, and I will 
uh, say to you that there was the one little glitch that we have the, the gates of JSON. They had to explicitly put it in there. But um, uh, we've kind of fixed that now. That isn't true so, anymore. So now when you go from gate to Stanford, the system detects, oh, your gate, I'm Stanford, let me run that converter. And when you go from Stanford to Open NLP, and that works in this one, um, that it, it automatically does the conversion. So people don't have to worry about um, using different tools. And they can test and mix and match and play with that uh, to get the best results. And that's very much actually the method used in this open advancement approach of development that was used to develop the Watson system. So how do we do this? Well, we achieved syntactic achieved pretty much with common physical formats. And there are obviously many legacy formats that we have to accommodate. And our attempt to achieve semantic interoperability is by creating common definitions for labeled data um, and providing a web accessible uh, repository that <clears throat> that we uh, that you can reference and I'll explain all this in a minute but of course this isn't really easy again in NLP we have things like is in the future a date <laughs> is the White House a location or an organization um, the White House said you know and then let alone that linguists don't even agree on what a noun is <laughs> I don't know why that happens. So, you know, especially in our field, it's difficult to identify a single representation that accommodates all kinds of language data and annotations, but JSON-LD has come very close to that. Difficult to get the community to agree or adopt a single standard, and we have a lot of need to accommodate legacy data. So, the convergence of the solution, oh geez, convergence of the solution is instead of defining a single, we have a universal <laughs> pivot. I don't know why this is doing this. Um, okay, okay. Um, and basically, we have a common, we want a physical format that is a serialization of a common abstract data model and a, a common set of structured terms, which is for semantics. So let me give you a, a quick a quick overview here because I'm, I, don't, I just don't know what to do. <laughs> How about if we turn it off and you speak really loudly for four minutes? <laughs> okay, I can try this. Well, I'm going to probably be longer than four minutes. This isn't on, though. Okay. <laughs> um, what we have is a lapse, uh, whoops, next slide, uh, interchange format, which has the following components. We do syntactic interoperability with JSON-LD. LD stands for linked data, if you didn't know that. And our semantic interoperability is through the Web Service Exchange vocabulary. And I'm going to go very, very fast uh, because I am. So um, we have our Web Service Exchange vocabulary is something that's interesting in the sense that we're developing it very, very much bottom up, very much on the fly. Um, and let me see. Yeah, the key strategy is bottom-up approach. We only define objects as we need them. Um, we have a very minimalist strategy. We have basic generic concepts like named entity, and then if you want, you go type equals protein, type equal gene, and then you can have other features if you want as well. And um, the other thing is that we link to definition in other repositories where possible. So very. Briefly, this is, again, this is right on the web. 
This is a exchange vocabulary. And you notice we have named entity. Notice the date, location, organization, and person are crossed out because we decided we're going to have a generic thing named entity. Type equals, you fill it in. And, you know, if, and if standard vocabularies are standard list develop and we can point to them, we will do that. Uh, but we don't as of yet. So then we develop a specification. This is the web page that you would point to. Um, so you have the uh, spec for token, and we link to something in a repository that's the same. And we also have uh, required that you document the software and the rules. So the references in the L JSON LD point to URIs that are in this web service uh, exchange vocabulary. And here, to get to the nitty gritty of it, is the um, is an example. So we have a base URI for our vocabulary, so we don't have to type it every time. We have metadata, and it describes this view. I think they're called denotations in pub annotation. Uh, we call it a view. And it says, this contains tokens, and the producer is this particular piece of software, which is our own type system. And then here in annotations, when we say type is token, that points to the definition that I just showed you on the web. And so you can, if you want to, you can uh, name that anything you want, as long as it points to the same thing. We all know that that's the same thing. And the features are also defined there. We can do visualization. We can do evaluation. As I said, this was the Watson thing. Um, I'm going to skip this, but um, we are. Uh, we think that the last Galaxy collaboration is actually uh, going to be very profitable. I have an example. I'm going to skip. But this is important. Uh, we have a new NSF grant just starting with Penn State, which is one of the main Galaxy developers. And what we are trying to do is, is to join up our text processing uh, framework and tools with the genomics things so that you can actually use those interoperability and perform a complete analysis. So you can use the NLP to extract stuff, and then you can feed that right into some analytic tool for genomics analysis. And that's what we want to do. We are also collaborating with the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration, who are using the LAPS grid for summarization and mining of clinical reports. We have a bunch of bio-NLP stuff in the LAPS grid, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and we have some data. But what I want to get to is what we just did. And I, I do have to another disclaimer. My research associate was sick. And so he, he did this in about an afternoon. And so it's a little less uh, robust than it might be. But you all know what pub annotation is, I believe. And you know what the left skirt is now. And so we wanted to see, can we make a data source, as we call it inside the lab's grid, to get pub annotation data to import and then use our tools to automatically annotate them and then export them to pub annotation. So it would kind of look like this. You would have pub annotation, you'd get a document, you'd convert to lift, do a little pipeline in the lab's grid, and then you'd export it and convert it back to the PA. So, you know, nice pub annotation uses JSON, so we use JSON-LD, not so different. That makes life easy. Semantic interoperability, however, is virtually impossible uh, between pub annotation and lapse grid because there is at present no attempt at all for any semantic interoperability in pub annotation. They say, use whatever tags you want. Um, so this causes a lot of problems. Um, how, do we how do we map to the lab's vocabulary items when there's nothing, we have no idea what anything is in the pub annotation thing. 
Um, and the pelvic annotation doesn't give us any metadata to indicate what annotation labels are in a denotation or view. So, uh, and if we have multiple views, uh, do they all get, we use multiple views for different layers. Do they all get combined into a single denotations element? Same thing for relations and parsers, multiple parsers. How to round trip data. There's really no way to extract the annotations from the denotations, separate them into views for laps, and then combine them again. And also, if you go from lift into pub annotation, you lose all our metadata. But, <clears throat> uh, and also, as far as we can tell, each pub annotation project is supposed to be one type of annotation. This might be wrong. But then that would make us, we would have to proliferate uh, uh, projects. Um, there's also some problems with microformats uh, and freeform attribute values. And if you go to this link, you'll see this is an annotation. This is a value of the obj feature. And it has all sorts of stuff in it that would require a parser more complex than the one to actually retrieve the feature to just understand it. So other problems converting to lip, uh, there are a lot of inconsistent attribute property names, a lot of typos. You guys should have a schema uh, that you can use to validate. Namespaces are not always defined. And we're not really sure how to interpret some of the object values like GGP, was it a POS tag? We didn't know what it was. So here's some suggestions. Add metadata to pub annotation. Try to find a way to improve semantic interoperability. And some other interesting suggestions include LAPS grid services as annotators in pub annotation. And let us include your corpora, anybody, not just pub annotation, or relevant tools in the LAPS grid. So what we can do here is uh, take pub annotation data that is just text, raw data, convert it to LIF, run something on it, and we convert, can convert it back to the PA format, and <clears throat> we will lose the metadata, but, um, but, but we can do it. And just to prove that to you, I won't run this. I will just show you where am I at? Uh, this is our Jetstream instance, and I've actually run a sequence here. Over here, I uh, ran a, 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 a pub annotation, sorry. I get a document, and I've convert, it automatically converts it to LIF. So this is it in LIF. Then I ran, we have a, a tool called Biomedical NER, which is a gate tool. And what? Oh, where is it? Um, what did I do? Oh, I see. I see, I see. So somehow this has to go in. There we go. <laughs> okay. Let me... Now, find that. Well, I'm going to have to like guess. Okay, so here, pub annotation. I do have this. Uh, this got the document. Sorry, this got the document. And there's it converted to lift automatically. I then use this tool from the gate suite, which uh, did biomedical NER, and uh, that's what you get because that's a gate output. I then ran a little pipeline that was pre-done um, to uh, get this in a format just so I could show you, and hopefully this will work, and it takes a minute. And by the way, this happens very fast, but it's the, the 
JavaScript that's slow. But you can see there's the protein annotations that's in our thing. And then we can uh, convert this to a JSON uh, pub annotation. And then we can submit it to the repository in, in our lapse test project. Okay, so, and it's there. If I can do this, uh, there it is. Uh, here it is, and I think, yeah, this is in, in text AE. You can see it has the same things. So at least we got started a bit with, uh, with some interoperability, and I think we identified a bunch of issues that might be important for the future for developing that piece of software and maybe other things uh, to be um, to be done in the future. So <laughs> I'm completely lost. I have a list of references at the end of my paper, at the end of my presentation that are, are on the in the slides that you have, but I can't get back to PowerPoint right now. So thank you very much for your attention.